So as you probably know, I actually didn't invent this. I didn't invent the conversations and I didn't invent the relationship. Tuggeran and Rook are based on two real people who lived 200 and something years ago, 250 years ago. Tuggeran is based on a young Aboriginal girl called Pachigarang and Daniel Rook is inspired by the historical character of William Dawes, who was in fact an astronomer and linguist with the First Fleet and also a soldier. I came across um, the Sydney language notebooks of William Dawes when I was researching the Secret River and I came across them in a book by Tim Flannery called The Birth of Sydney in which he's brought together the kind of highlights of all the people in the First Fleet who left behind documents about their time there. These language notebooks are incredible because what they what they write down, what they record, is not just a language, not just lists of words and templates of verbs, although that's there too, but Dawes wrote down entire conversations, whole exchanges, word for word, mostly between him and Pachigarang. And reading, reading these notebooks, uh, I can't tell you how electrifying it was to read them and think these two people are having a relationship that no one would dare to invent. They're having conversations like this one that are unimaginable. And the, the powerful thing about it is it really did happen. That conversation, uh, if you wash yourself off and you shall become white, and no, I shall not become white, and the fact that he then realised that she was joking, all that really happened. So my challenge as a novelist was mm, quite a difficult one because it was to keep the extraordinary raw power of the relationship that blazes off the page of the notebooks, uh, but put it together in such a way that it became contextualised, those conversations, make a plausible scenario in which to embed them, and beyond that, make a larger picture of a narrative in which they make sense and in which they have something larger to say about friendship and language and shared history, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And uh, the leader of this expedition was to be a man that I've called Talbot Silk, who is a kind of um, coded version, really, of what Watkintench. No point pretending that this is not a roman à clé. Um, so, interesting, when I was writing this book, um, I've, I realised about halfway through it, with huge pleasure, that I was writing a book that might be seen as a mirror image to The Secret River. In The Secret River you have a man who makes a choice which closes down conversation. At the end of the Secret River, as some of you probably know, um, there is no way forward in communicating across the gulf of cultures. A, a great and terrible silence hangs over the landscape at the end of that book. This book, I realised with huge joy, as I wrote, is, if you like, the, the, the sort of positive side of that negative, the sunny, the sunny story to go with that dark one. Because in this book, a conversation begins and opens up and is incredibly enriching and it, it keeps going in a sort of a way. And this book sort of has a happy ending. There's a sense of what is possible speaking across cultures. There is a sense of the possibility of good in our shared history, as well as the as well as the negative, which we're familiar with. I had, writing this book was an extraordinary journey for me. I got very fond of Daniel Rook and Tagaran and admired them hugely for doing this impossible thing of leaping into each other's cultures. So I, I learned a lot uh, writing it and I really enjoyed it. So I hope that you enjoy living in their world as much as I did. Thanks very much. And what I discovered, um, I mean, I still can't, you know, do maths or add two and two, but I, I learned that creativity in science and mathematics is exactly of the same order, reading books about mathematicians. It's an imaginative leap. It's not just a plod through, you know, A plus B equals C. It's an imaginative leap. Um, and that was brilliant. I also did, it seems to be creating a great deal of problem, the fact that I'm writing historical fiction and that I'm in many ways sticking fairly closely to the facts, but then I'm changing them as well. I mean, the easy answer 
is to say, this is a novel, I made it all up. Clearly that's not so. I mean, you obviously know a good bit about this and you recognise, as I intend people to. What I'm hoping... See, uh, well, there are a lot of things, but I guess one of the answers is to say I'm not really... Well, first of all, in this book I have made it very clear that it is not history. Let there be no, under, no misunderstanding. I don't think that I'm writing history. I know that I'm not. So let's get that one out of the way. But I realise... When those historians attacked me, I had thought long and hard about what I'm doing here. And what I realise is that unlike them, I'm not actually all that interested in history per se. What I'm interested in actually is today, us, here and now. And the past gives you one more window into the present. So in that sense, their attacks have kind of bewildered me in a way, because I think, you know, I'm not trying to write history. I'm actually writing about us now because reading the, writing The Secret River uh, alerted me to the fact that as a descendant of, you know, uh, 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 an early settler, or I suppose all of us who are newcomers to Australia, we all have to come find our own accommodation with the fact that we have come here and, uh, you know, dispossessed the people whose land it was. And we will all arrive at a different way of coming to terms with that. And the reading, writing these books is kind of my way of doing it. What you know about the Gadigal language is in fact what William Dawes left. Uh, a few other people, First Fleet people, left a few other word lists, but basically what we know of Gadigal is in the two little blue notebooks which are now in a London museum. My decision in writing the book was not to invent any of the dialogue between Tagaran and Rook, to use only, and there's plenty there, the dialogue that was already you know, given to me like a gift from the cosmos in these two. Um, there are linguists who, are, who have looked at the Gadigal language as much as it's possible, and it has been reconstructed. I mean, it's not spoken by anybody anymore, but it has been reconstructed to the point where the local descendants of the Gadigal people can give welcome to country and so on in Gadigal, which is pretty amazing to hear. And what they're largely drawing on is William Dawes, and that seems to me a most wonderful, you know... Shared history. They were they were in there together, and they've given a gift which 250 years later we can we can value. The conversations that Tagaran and Rook had almost left us a model for what's possible today. At a point when I was halfway through this book, or more than halfway through it, um, I was in Canberra and I stood on the lawns of Parliament House when Rudd delivered his apology to the stolen generations, and I can't remember the exact metaphors he used, but. It, I seem to remember that he talked a lot about not only turning a new page, but also opening up conversations. And I thought, isn't this amazing? We have here, in the relationship between Pachigarang and Dawes, a model that we might remember that this has happened in the past, this relationship across the cultures. It therefore might be possible again. That sounds a bit Pollyanna-ish, but you know, without a kind of positive model, um, you wonder whether it was possible. This, this says, yes, it is possible. It has happened. That makes this book not just, a, not just another historical novel. Um, you know, in 2008, post Kevin Rudd's apology, we're entering another kind of Australia and another kind of possibility for dialogue between black and white is opening up, I think, for the first time uh, in 200 years, for the first time since Dawes had his conversations with Pachi Goren. So in a way, um, I'm thinking that his story tells us something that might be useful for us going into the future. Oh, I did a lot of other things. Um, I knew I wanted to write, but I had no idea you could actually have it as a kind of a career. Um, I went into the film industry first and learned a great deal about writing by editing films, uh, documentary films. Um, I then went to London and got all sorts of odd jobs, the way you do. Um, did a stint at SBS television, sub-editing the subtitles. So I've done a few and I've made my share of milkshakes and cappuccinos. Um, I think a writer has to have a wide world experience. You can't just sit in your room. You need to actually have story. I couldn't see any point in that. But what I did want to say was, what was the power structure then? And above all, how has it shaped where we are today? I'm not intrinsically all that interested in the past. What I am very interested in is where we are today and the dilemmas that we all face together. Um, 
Um, and the only way to understand those, I think, is to look back and see where they, how they evolved. Because if you can see how they evolved, you have some kind of a chance of approaching them in an intelligent way and you know, making thicken over. I mean, the question that all these books really ask underneath is, um, what does it mean to belong to a place? What does that mean? Uh, for me, why I write has nothing to do with any of that stuff. For me, writing is a, is a question that I need to a- answer for myself. Um, and the only way I can answer it seems to be to have the conversation with myself that is writing. So I talk my way through. And because I'm genuinely interested in the question, and because I genuinely don't know the answer, I have to keep asking it and writing until I get to some point of equality. Yeah, I am a big believer in rewriting to the extent that I do usually 23, 24. I did 23 drafts of Sarah Thornhill and that was before it went to the publisher and there would have been another few drafts after that. Um, It's not a matter that I write the whole thing through and then put the full stop and then start again at the beginning because I don't write in a a consecutive way. I start a book at the point where I'm most interested. So it's often a scene halfway through the book but it's the central heart of the dramatic dilemma of the book that I generally start with because you've got to go with the energy you can't it's not like painting by numbers it's not a job if your heart's not in it the reader will know so I write a lot of fragments which are disconnected like a jigsaw I guess it's a corny metaphor but it's true Um, and a lot of the rewriting is in fact assembling the jigsaw how does that scene fit to that scene Is this character actually, does this scene actually belong to this character or should the actor in that scene in fact be another character altogether? I rewrite sentences a lot because I love a a sentence that has a, a poetic cadence, whatever that might be. It seems to me very important that a sentence be beautiful, if I can possibly make it. Um, So um, some parts of the book I write in the beginning and first draft and they almost never change through all those drafts but most parts at some stage get radically rewritten. To me writing, to me writing is not writing, it's rewriting, that is the process.